Robert Wagner. He is a professor and head of Purdue University's Department of Forestry and Natural Resources. We all know him as a, a being on the faculty of the University of Maine, where he was the Henry Saunders Distinguished Professor in Forestry. He did a lot for us up here in Maine in terms of uh, talking about forestry and promoting its use. And uh, we even hold them back, I think, during the debates about very old applications of herbicides. And we got to, to experience the uh, ACF committee and uh, do his best to try and help us make people understand the importance of uh, vegetation management. So we're glad to have him here today. And Bob, thank you so much for coming, and I'll give you the book. Thank you. Very good. Uh, can you uh, can you everybody hear me in the back okay? Great. Great. So, so again, yeah, wonderful to be back uh, in Maine. I'm sure to sure a little bit in particular. I've been enjoying it about four months, five months from now, even more. But uh, this will do a great scene for some uh, familiar faces as well. Um, and uh, so I'm looking forward to interacting with all of you. Uh, so, so the, I'm just going to give this presentation. Uh, I'm just going to give some conversations and then have the uh, uh, testimony uh, and give it to the. Uh, committee and, 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 and anyway uh, I got a call some months ago last year you're giving this talk uh, in California which I just did about a month ago and they were having the forestry community in California exactly the same problems with uh, opposition like I say on the other side as uh, all of our very familiar and so the I got the call because there's a whole generation of young foresters that really not been exposed to the science behind forest vegetation management. I was asked to give a, a summary of what we know and what the science says about managing forest vegetation in young, young forest stands. So I'm going to try to do that today. It's all this is deep and wide science. So I'm going to give you my best thumbnail sketch of where we are. Uh, I thought it would be uh, helpful for those of you that are not familiar to understand how vegetation management has played a role in the main forests uh, over the past 40 years of, of data showing herbicide treatment in red, in the red line, and uh, pre-commercial thinning in the blue line, obviously years, and uh, the land area is treated. And uh, obviously, a very interesting uh, pattern there. It, uh, for those of you that are old enough to remember, I think that few of you in here, there's a big bug on Mount Rainier in 65 to 90, really devastated in the early years of uh, Northern Maine. There's a lot of salvage harvesting that went on, a lot of clear cutting, which generated its own controversy. But of course, behind that was a lot of interest in regenerating spruce fir back in its forests as quickly as possible. And uh, this is what really established this period of uh, high uh, herbicide application in these forests up over the most uh, 1989, 90,000 acres a year were treated. So pretty, pretty dramatic. Almost a million acres, 900,000 or so total over that period were treated. That established a lot of young spruce fir forests uh, that are that are there today. The, uh, that was followed, as you can see, by uh, in the blue line. Uh, once those trees, those spruce fir, were regenerated, they were close together and needed to be spaced, and so that gave rise to a pretty good size uh, pre-commercial thinning or PCT programs during that era. And since about early 2000s, we've been in this sort of post budworm they call FPA, partial harvesting, uh, the Forest Practices Act era, and both uh, pre-commercial thinning and herbicide use are around 10 or so thousand acres a year in the forest. So I wanted to give you today just a quick overview of vegetation management science, uh, what we know. Um, I've been working in this field for about 40 years, so this is sort of Wagner's worldview of a lot of scientific literature for what it's worth. And, uh, and then the question I want to address is science dead and three factors that are working against science when we're dealing with uh, this topic in particular in, uh, in public. So just a bit about the history of forest vegetation management research. There's really a strong scientific literature associated with forest vegetation management. 
and it coincides with the rise of modern forestry and forest regeneration back to the 1950s and uh, 1960s. There, there are many, I've never counted them, but there are many thousands of scientific papers that are relevant to this particular field, and you'll see what I'm talking about shortly. The uh, peak productivity for this research was pretty much the 1970s through the uh, 1990s. After 1990, there was a, a sharp decline in a, in a lot of the research that was uh, going on at the time, uh, mostly due to the adoption of ecosystem management policy by the U.S. Forest Service, which changed the demand for regeneration information um, in, in forestry, and the, the sell-off of forest industry lands to REITs and TMOs uh, during this period. Both of these were pretty significant. It changed the demand for scientific information about this particular uh, uh, topic. Uh, so, do we really need forest vegetation management is sort of the basic question. And if you look at the literature, there, uh, this research went on in sort of three areas of the three geographic areas of North America. We call them Pacific, you know, obviously Pacific Northwest, where Douglas fir and uh, other important uh, tree species are. Uh, the southeastern U.S. with the Huron level and mine regeneration, and across uh, much of the northern forest, which includes uh, Maine. And there's a, uh, you know, these are the primary tree producing areas. Uh, wood volume producing areas of North America, so it's logical that these are the areas where this research would have been a focus. And the, the data is really amazing. Uh, some years ago, I did the, a survey of the longest running studies in forest vegetation management across North America. And uh, it's, uh, they're, they're, it's pretty dramatic. If you move, and uh, this is just a shot of one experiment in southwestern Oregon showing uh, harvest with no forest regeneration, or excuse me, planting, but no forest vegetation management, and it, it really creates nothing but brush fields, nearly complete regeneration failure. And uh, however, if you do good mechanical site preparation and herbicide treatment, those are the ponderosa pine, and this is the same age, uh, eight years, what it looks like. So dramatic, absolutely dramatic differences in the outcome. Many uh, hundreds of percent difference in volume. Uh, in the southeast, they discovered exactly the same thing, trying to grow a lot of pine. The, uh, of course, they tend, tended to have pretty good site preparation, but they really discovered back in the mid 70s the importance of competition from grasses and forests that are shown in the top picture, and that's uh, regeneration, a lot of volume, but with no, no herbicide or vegetation, herbaceous vegetation control. And with just two years of herbaceous vegetation control, these are the same six-year-old lot of volume pine. So really dramatic differences in tree growth that have been documented in a wide variety of studies. Uh, in fact, uh, some of the Southern universities have done really a wonderful job of multi-state uh, replicated experiments looking at the yield effects of vegetation management. So very strong data and uh, tens and hundreds and even thousands of percent difference in yield uh, as a result of vegetation management. We moved to the northern forest. We found pretty much the same kind of thing. Here's just a shot of a white spruce stand. This one's in uh, southern Canada with, uh, you know, uh, four times more merchantable volume with uh, good vegetation management, some early, early thing. And the northern uh, forest experiments showed very similar percentage gains in the hundreds of percents of yield as a result of doing early vegetation management. Uh, and in fact, I'd be remiss if I didn't talk about Maine in this regard, and that we have up near Bingham the longest running forest herbicide experiment in North America. In fact, probably the world, I suspect, in my travels. I've never seen one this long. Uh, Max McCormick set this one up back in the late 70s. This is a shot in 1978, one year after the herbicide treatment. Some pretty dramatic differences in the amount of vegetation control. The question was, did this really make a difference over time? And uh, during my uh, later years at the University of Maine, we, uh, you know, we resurrected, reestablished, and measured the 40 year outcomes as a result of this experiment. And this summarizes that. You can see the, the no treatment at the top, largely uh, you know, aspen, uh, red maple, and uh, the 
herbicide only in the middle, more mixed species stands, and then followed with herbicide, followed with PCT at the bottom. So very dramatic difference. What's interesting is the total standing volumes, as we're talking about that, uh, biomass, total standing biomass. These three pictures, by the way, is this a computer generated version of the actual data of these plots? Uh, is the, the total standing biomass is the same in these three pictures? And uh, the species diversity and richness is, is, is the same. What's different is the proportion of species that occupy the stand. If you're interested in growing merchantable softwood, the formula here is pretty clear. And what was interesting is, although at the time of Austin Pond's study, there was a lot of debate about which herbicide was better than which and whatnot. Four years later, the trees told us they really didn't care. They only cared whether they were sprayed or not. And that was the big, that was the kind of the moral of the story. So we looked at 30 long-term studies across North America, and all three of these forest regions I talked about. And this is the volume of untreated plots versus the volume of the best treatment in these long-term experiments. And of this, uh, so we suppose dots is, a, is an experiment uh, somewhere in North America. And what we found is that uh, volume gains from good vegetation management were 30 to 500 percent uh, increases in, in stand volume as a result of doing good vegetation management. Obviously, a fair bit of variability. Uh, what we tended to find in these data is that there would be thousand, thousand percent differences in the outcome of the young forests if there was substantial regeneration failure, as I showed you in that northern California, southern Oregon. If, uh, if there are unwanted trees or shrubs that can competitively displace some of the plant, planted or desired trees, uh, you know, 100 to thousands of percent increase in yield. And if the uh, if, if all the trees are going to survive, but there's just herbaceous competition there, between 10 to 10 to 100 percent increases uh, in uh, stand volume as a result of that. So, uh, it all depends on the situation you're dealing with and in what forest type. But in any any way you cut it, in any, any one of these regions, an investment in vegetation management pays off uh, in, in very big ways. Uh, since a lot of this work was done in um, North America, since then, as many of you know, uh, plantation culture in Brazil and South Africa and New Zealand have really taken off. And they've now developed their own body of literature. And they have found exactly the same thing. And even in, uh, in spades, more the uh, eucalyptus culture, uh, radiata pine culture, uh, loblolly pine culture in all of these southern hemisphere forests, not possible without strong forest vegetation management. And they've, uh, they've replicated the kinds of results I just showed you for North America. So pretty substantial. You know, do we need herbicides? Uh, yes if you want to grow young forests uh, quickly or replace what was there previously. Uh, one of the things, just in the way of a few principles that are interesting, uh, one of the things, particularly a credit to uh, Lee Allen in, uh, from Virginia Tech, or excuse me, North, North Carolina State University, but work that was done with Virginia Tech, uh, had been looking at why, you know, why these young stands. One of the things we would see is that when you do these, uh, these big percentage increases, these are always diverging growth curves over time when they're treated early on. And the question is, well, why is this divergence so great? And one of the things they discovered with Aubrey Pine in these experiments, what they showed is with vegetation management, and this kind of makes sense, we're putting more leaves on trees. All right? So trees have more leaves, more leaf area per tree or per unit area of ground as a result of doing vegetation management. But the other really interesting finding is that that leaf area that, so there's not only more leaf area, but each square inch of leaves produce more stem volume. So the efficiency of the leaves is greater. And that's one of the reasons that we see these just really tremendous increases over time. So leaves grow trees and vegetation management grows leaves and those leaves are more efficient. And this is one of the reasons we see uh, these great uh, yield differences. A uh, colleague of mine, uh, Tom Fox, who was at for, uh, Virginia Tech, uh, who's now the vice president for Rainier, I believe, uh, did a really cool uh, summary of what happened in the southern pine region over from 1940 to the 
early 2000s. And here's just a shot of what uh, the bars are total yield from 1940 to 2010. And the black uh, line is the pulpwood rotation age. So what, what, he, what he described over time based on the forest research that was done and implemented in the Southern Pine region is that they were able to grow from 50 to 200 tons per acre per year in more in, in, 70, uh, in 70 years. And they went from a 50 year to a 20 year rotation during that period. So they quadrupled productivity and more than halved the rotation time to get there during this period. And most of these gains have required effective vegetation management. He, in the same publication, describes what were the, the key technological advances in forestry that allowed these, this tremendous change in yields in the Southern Pine region. And you can see the, the uh, legend there, you know, it was clonal and bio, uh, biotechnology, tree improvement, uh, fertilization and whatnot. And, if, and those are the, the bar at the bottom, the bars at the bottom show the relative contribution of each of those new technologies to the yield of Southern Pine stands. What's really interesting to me as someone who does forest vegetation management is that the, the gains that came from the introductions of these technologies really weren't possible without good early vegetation control in these stands. So I could argue vegetation management has been responsible or a major contributing factor to the uh, success of these increase in yields. Uh, and those in the Southern Hemisphere are seeing exactly the same thing. So I'm gonna leave that topic. So if you're wondering why do we need to use herbicides in the field based on the world literature, you're darn right. And it's a really strong literature uh, that we have to draw on. Um, a lot of the other work that's been done in vegetation management relates to the methods of managing forest vegetation. And that is obviously mostly herbicides. Uh, you know, 2,4-D was uh, uh, discovered and synthesized in the late 1940s. And that really launched a whole revolution in all forms of plant culture with the advent of herbicides. Of course, herbicides go back many thousands of years, uh, and go into that history. But uh, modern era of uh, you know, synthesized herbicides is, uh, goes back to the mid 40s. So, uh, and I know those of you in the back uh, can't read this table and I don't expect you to. Uh, what, the, the question is, you know, which, which herbicides kill which plants? And actually it turns out, although we know a lot about this, it's mostly not in the literature, mostly because the scientific journals don't publish this stuff. And you've got to find it in deep, dark, uh, gray literature, as we call it. But uh, this table just is, a, is an extension publication from Oregon State University showing herbicides across the top, a wide range of species on, you know, in the column to the left, and then whether those herbicides are effective at killing those particular species. The, uh, and, and so uh, one of the things I tell my students when I'm teaching this stuff is that this is one of these areas that it's really not much in the way of science. Uh, this is where we do, uh, this is more art and experience doing this part of vegetation management than it is science. Uh, we use scientific methodology to determine these kinds of responses, but uh, the, uh, as I said, it doesn't end up in the literature. So. Uh, it's one of these things that's really hard to communicate. If you wanted to go to the scientific literature to defend what we do and in this area, it's actually tough. There's some, there is some out there, but uh, we're, I'd say this is a bit of a weak spot or weird weak spot in the literature. But we do know a lot, but it largely comes from the experience of those regeneration foresters out there applying herbicides and uh, understanding what effect they have in these, in these plant communities that they're treating. One of the things that we really know a lot about, and this is largely thanks to the agricultural community, which has continued to do a lot of intensive cellular and biochemical based research and understanding how herbicides work. And it's impossible to, to really cover this. This is a, plant, a cross section of a plant cell. And you can see these different types of herbicides that we use these different families. We have a really good understanding scientifically, right down to the biochemical pathways, where these herbicides go in the plant, what effects they have, um, how they're decomposed in the cells, and how they're moved. And, and it is, and it's, it's astonishing literature. It's obviously very uh, technical 
if you're not uh, involved in uh, you know plant physiology or plant biochemistry. But just to let you know that if you want to go to the literature, there's really a deep understanding of how these herbicides operate inside plants and what effects they have. In fact, we understand down to the biochemical basis why plants are resistant or develop resistance to particular herbicides, which is a widespread problem uh, in use of herbicides across agriculture and other areas. Um, I spent my early career hanging out with a bunch of herbicide toxicologists, so I, uh, I, I won't pretend to be a toxicologist, but I listened to lots of lectures uh, over and over again from the people that really do understand this area. And largely thanks to the pe uh, pesticide regular regulatory requirements by EPA, uh, by all, by, by in the U.S. and by all major governments uh, in the Western world largely, who have strict requirements for documenting the toxicity of these materials and their environmental behavior before they're registered. Uh, this is, uh, we talk about Rachel Carson and Silent Spring, but the pesticide regulatory process and the, the strong data demands came from that awareness uh, back in the 60s and 70s. And anyway, the, the, thanks to those pesticide regulatory requirements, there is a deep understanding of the uh, toxicology of these materials, the acute and chronic toxicity, and the probability of exposure in, the for, in any uh, you know, agricultural environment and uh, food residues and uh, or pesticide residues in food. So pretty good understanding. If you want to go to that literature, it is very deep and wide on any one of these uh, herbicides that we use. Uh, glyphosate is the most widely used uh, herbicide in the world, hands down, and it is the most, literally the most studied compound in the world. So that literature is, uh, is a monster if you want to get into it. We also, thanks to that, those same uh, regulatory requirements, un uh, under, understand how, uh, the, you know, what the fate of these herbicides are in the environment once they're released. The uh, graph in there, Kind of diagram in the upper right just shows all of these ecosystem components and uh, where once herbicides are deposited on leaves or on soil, what their environmental fate is, where do they travel, what ecosystem components, how long are they there, what, uh, what's their concentration when they're there, and how do they move and eventually decompose uh, in the environment. We've got a really strong understanding of that, thanks largely to the agricultural research community that has done uh, tremendous work. Again, a very deep and wide literature if you want to get into it. Uh, we understand what the, uh, uh, the decomposed products are, and don't, you, we don't expect you again to see the graph on the bottom, but the, all of the, de the decomposed um, metabolites of glyphosate, we know what those are, we can detect them and follow them until eventually those, uh, those molecules are completely decomposed into their basic uh, atomic components and where they go. The, uh, and the, the level of detection is astonishing. So once these, uh, we, can, we can detect these materials many times below any level of biological significance. And just to give you a sense, the level of detection, chemical detection for glyphosate in water is less than one part per trillion. And to give you the same, to give you some understanding of what a part per trillion is, that's like finding one drop of water in 20 Olympic sized swimming pools. So if we're, if it's there, we can find it and track it. And that same, you know, chemical uh, detection methodology is used to track these materials through the environments. So we can document very well uh, what's gone on, particularly in agricultural ecosystems. But there have been over the years, really since the 1960s, quite a number of comprehensive studies on how these herbicides behave in forested environments. And I just, the lower right shows just the graph of uh, the Carnation Creek study, which is probably the most comprehensive forest ecosystem study. It took place in Canada, but a pretty good understanding of where these materials go and decompose in forest environments as well. So if you want to find a strong literature, it's there for forestry and backed up in spades in the ag in agricultural ecosystems. I was going to say there's, uh, if you're really interested in this topic, uh, Pesticides in the Environment by uh, Jerry Stevenson and Keith Solomon is a really good summary of what we know about the science of the environmental fate of herbicides. The other area we're pretty good at is uh, herbicide application technology. 
A lot of this goes back to the Cold War and the military trying to understand how droplets move in the environment during the nuclear fallout era. And uh, so thanks to a lot of the military research and, and, and subsequent research in agriculture pesticide application technology over, the, over 60 years, we've inherited as forestry a pretty deep understanding of the physics of, uh, and the technology of herbicide application. We understand how droplets behave in the environment. Uh, our nozzles have gotten so much better um, with the uh, AccuFlow nozzles. These are needle, needle style um, uh, nozzles that will that produce very uniform droplets. And we can predict their behavior uh, very accurately in terms of how they're gonna fall once they leave, leave an aircraft, even including all of the wind, uh, wind issues and height and evaporative issues. Uh, there, are, there are some really nice computer models that you can take and uh, plug in particular uh, situations. It's called AgDisk. And if you want to be able to predict how droplets will uh, behave out of an aircraft, a helicopter or fixed wing, we can do that. We also have had tremendous advances in GPS technology, satellite navigation and aircraft. And it, it's possible to you know, document and produce knife edge um, Spray, spray lines uh, with, with uh, aircraft these days. So really, a, a, I think a pretty strong uh, science and technology background to this particular area, if anybody wants to find it. One of the big questions in forestry, particularly around herbicides, going back to the very beginning, going back to the 70s in particular, was the effect of vegetation management and particularly herbicides on, on wildlife. And I've always found this to be an interesting question because the, you, if you go back to the her early herbicide literature, the first uses of herbicides on wild landscapes were wildlife biologists. And these were, uh, ha happened largely in the West and they were, interest they were a lot of overgrazed rangelands and a lot of interest in converting these overgrazed shrub dominated systems in the West to uh, produce more grasses and forbs for uh, deer, elk, and also livestock. So the very earliest literature of, of use of herbicides in wild landscapes was actually to improve wildlife habitat. Uh, so, but it's a very logical question as we got into forested environments. So what effect does herbicides have on, do, do herbicides have on these uh, wildlife populations? This too is a pretty rich literature. If you're interested uh, on all, uh, all manner of organisms uh, from you know, microscopic through uh, you know, and uh, insects and amphibians, small mammals, and large, larger wildlife, uh, and birds in included. And I'm gonna, you know, I'm gonna try to do my best to, to summarize what we know. And one of the reasons I say this is we, a number of years ago, this is back in 2004, the Wildlife Society produced a whole uh, publication, a journal publication on what we knew about herbicide effects on wildlife. And the general conclusion is that the lar based on from all the studies is that the largest impact of herbicides on wildlife comes from the habitat alteration that happens as a result of herbicides doing what we want them to do. But depending on the species, populations can be either reduced, increased, or unaffected, depending on what system you're dealing with. And the, the literature shows that they tend to be local and kind of temporary in nature. And one of the reasons is wildlife have much larger uh, territories than just where we would spray, for example. So it's actually, uh, it's complicated, but you're, if, no matter which wildlife species you are, you're either be, you know, decreasing your populations, increasing, or it's just unaffected. But those effects tend to be relatively short term and these populations all rebound as the habitat that is treated recovers in different ways. So, uh, and the other interesting thing that's out there is that vegetation management can maintain these early successional conditions for longer periods of times in forest, which uh, turned out to have documented benefits for many birds, small mammal, ungulate, and other species. And especially for a number of declining bird species. Uh, in fact, this is true where I'm working in the, right now in the central hardwood forests of Indiana in the Midwest, the lack of disturbance uh, is a real problem for survival of a number of uh, bird species of conservation concern. So again, this is one of these places where the, the, uh, herbicides can be used to enhance wildlife habitat. Definitely true in the southeastern states as well, where they're deliberately used to manipulate vegetation for quail and other populations. 
And uh, the, the studies on the general toxicological effects, direct, direct toxicity to herbicides, are, are generally of low concern uh, because of the low exposure, the short environmental residence time, and the lack of bioaccumulation or biomagnification in these systems. So most wildlife biologists that understand this will explain that they're not worried about the to direct toxic effects. Uh, they really want to understand the, the effects of habitat manipulation that come from uh, the herbicide impact itself. The, uh, I've had some calls in recently, particularly in the regions of the uh, in states where uh, the use of herbicides have been really restricted and the uh, foresters want to know, well, what can I do if I lose herbicides? And it turns out this is a weak spot in the, in the literature. I spent some time in my mid-career looking at alternatives to herbicides for just this reason. But when herbicides, you got to remember that all of the, you know, although we talk about the alternatives to herbicides, herbicides were the alternative to everything else that, uh, that we had available to manage forest vegetation. So things like mechanical uh, equipment, manual cutting, prescribed fire, grazing animals, mulches, uh, cover crops, uh, all of those are really quite old. Uh, some go back to Roman times. And uh, biological control is relatively new. But the literature out there for alternatives to herbicides is really pretty weak. And if someone, when, I, when someone asks me, well, where's the literature on this? I can only port to some, you know, a couple handfuls of studies on this particular topic. So um, it's, it's not because necessarily we don't understand it from a practice point of view, but the documented scientific literature on this topic isn't all that strong. So that is my whirlwind tour of what we know about forest vegetation management and the science behind it over the past 60 plus years. So I wanted to get to the question of, so is the science dead? Um, of course not. Uh, we've got more than a half century of literature, data, and field studies that are out there uh, for all to see and debate. Uh, good research stands in, uh, the test of time. In fact, I remember many years ago, it was the late 70s, I was a graduate student and I was really discouraged about the lack of public understanding of the science that we were doing. And just the, out, you know, this, it was just outright wrong. And uh, talking to my, one of my mentors, and I explained my dismay, should I even be in science because people don't believe this stuff anyway. And uh, he said, Bob, good, good, that's what he said, good scientific research stands the test of time. And uh, he made a pretty good case for that. And uh, I actually spent the next 40 years in forest research because I actually believed that when he told me it. And 40 years later, I still believe the same thing. Science is a, you know, a refined methodology to understand how systems work, and we've got a pretty good data associated with that. The, uh, but as we all know, science does not exist in a vacuum. It's understood, uh, it exists, it's understood and applied in a social political context. Um, I just read this recently from an epidemiologist, says, quote, uh, science inhabits a world of money and votes, a world of media inquiry and lobbyists of industry and environmental activism, religions, political ideologies, and all the other complexities of human life. And boy, is that clear. This was a, uh, this epidemiologist's frustration with uh, what's going on with, you know, talk about science and COVID and vaccines right now. The... Uh, I think, you know, looking at the literature, there's sort of three issues that are working against public acceptance of forest vegetation management science. And I'm going to talk about each of these. One is how the public perceives risk, which we know a fair bit about, um, a bit about the death of expertise and uh, the human versus nature conflict. And I think all three of these enter into this conversation about whether science is accepted or how what we all do in forestry is viewed. So the the... There, there's a couple truisms out there in the social science research uh, about humans and being able to predict things. It turns out we're really bad at predicting the future as a general rule. And the other thing we're really pretty, pretty bad at is, is predicting risk of certain activities. And as the research shows, and this little graph in the upper right hand shows the, the curve is the, uh, the actual perceptions and the straight line is where actual deaths equal estimated death due to different cause, causative factors. And what you can see is how the curved line falls below the straight line. So we're pretty bad at underestimating actual death rates for the highest risk activities. And uh, we tend to overestimate 
death rates for the safest activities. Uh, and so this just tends to be true all the time in this research that's been uh, done. But that affects how people view uh, the risks of what we, what we do. So there's uh, Paul Slovic is really the uh, social scientist that really brought this public perceptions of risk uh, science to the, to the forefront. And his, his conclusion here, and I'm uh, describing what, how he describes this world we live in with perceptions of risk, that the public sees things, things that they dread, um, and what he calls dread, and these are risks that are uncontrollable, catastrophic, um, being seen as not being fair. Uh, they're not easily reduced. reduced. Uh, anything having to do with kids uh, is a dread and uh, becomes a, a, you know, a very uh, uh, high profile risk. And then on the opposite end of the spectrum where they don't dread the outcome, where the risks are controllable, they, you know, they believe they're equitable, that the risks are easily reduced. The other dimension is whether they understand the risk or not. It's either unknown or in, from their perception or known. And so it kind of creates this axis of how risks are viewed. So following from this idea of dread on one end and no dread on the other, and it's either known or unknown, there, there are those things that, we, uh, that fall into this category. Now these again are public perceptions of these, uh, these differences but things they don't dread or are known, like alcohol, chainsaws, swimming pools, downhill skiing, right up the hill, um, motorcycles, not, not a lot of um, dread about those, and the public feels that they understand those risks. On the opposite end of that are these things that the public dreads and really feels they don't understand, things like nuclear waste and PCBs and electrical fields, uh, and then, of course, there are those categories of they dread them but feel that they um, no, understand them, fires and railroad collisions, handguns, and up in the upper left, things that ah, we don't know but I really don't dread the outcome, things like the risks of microwave ovens and fluoridation in water, x-rays, antibiotics, and so forth. So where do pesticides fall in this? They fall in that upper right-hand quadrant where people dread, dread the effects and don't feel that they understand them, which gets us to stigmatize the idea of stigmatized technology. And a technological stigma is any profile media event that um, involves technology that share a common risk perception characteristics, particularly high dread, it's an involuntary risk, it's unknown, and particularly a problem for future generations. And uh, Slovic's book here, Cover of Perception of Risk, is really a wonderful document if you want to understand this. And of course, uh, these are actually pictures from my television. And for those of you that watch any television these days, will see these, uh, the class action ambulance chasers with the glyphosate uh, lawsuits. So what do you think the effect of that exposure over and over again on televisions across the United States all the time has on making glyphosate a stigmatized technology. You couldn't have done a better, if you wanted to stigmatize something, you couldn't do a better job. So it's, and, and the fallout of that and the perceptions of risks and this, the stigmatized technology that come from herbicides and particularly Roundup is, is right there for all of us to see. One of the things uh, Slovic showed in this research is that on the same scale, each of those dots is a particular technology and asked people how they, whether they wanted to regulate that technology or not. So the big circle, the bigger the circle, the more interest there was on the public to, to regulate that technology. So, you, so larger circles indicate greater desire for strict regulation. And as you can see, once you get up into that upper quadrant where the stigmatized technologies are, there's a desire on the part of the public to regulate those risks. I got really interested years ago when we were looking actually at alternatives to herbicides and I was working in Ontario, uh, Canada at the time, whether uh, how the public perceives risk. And there was a common perception among those of us in forestry that it was all those people in the cities that were screwing things up, that people out in rural communities that were in timber dependent communities really understood this stuff and saw the world differently. So we actually went out and surveyed over 2000 of them uh, people in, across Ontario in timber-dependent communities and the, and the general public 
And this is a list of general risk topics, uh, cigarette smoking, groundwater, sun tanning, motor vehicle accidents, just a general list of activities that can cause harm in, um, in society and how they perceive the risk of these. So this is the percent of the population ranking these things as high risk and cigarette smoking was, was right at the top because cigarette smoking education has been pretty, uh, pretty efficient. But you can see the red bars and the blue bars, there's not much difference. So timber dependent communities, in fact, in some cases, the timber dependent community saw more risk than the general public. So it kind of shattered this idea that, well, it's the cities and the voters there that are driving this stuff that, by the way, people in across rural Maine see the world in very similar ways um, to people in, in cities. One of the things was we threw in two uh, activities, loss of forest environment and using herbicides in the forest. So herbicides in forest is above, is seen as riskier than nuclear power plants. Um, and, uh, right near dioxin from pulp mills. And even more interesting, loss of the forest environment was right near the top and seen as risky. So one of the things we asked, well, do foresters perceive the world differently than, um, than the rest of us? So this is just, again, the same categories of risk. And we've got, we looked at uh, government wildlife biologists, government foresters and industry foresters. And, and uh, any dot left of that dotted line, it reflects the, uh, how the, these groups perceive risk. And you can see we in the forestry community see risk as less for all of those activities, even common activities, than, um, uh, than the general public. Um, and that's, so there's a message to us. When we're talking to the public, keep in mind and, uh, that we're, we as group tend to perceive risk low, uh, less than the people that we're talking to, neighbors or the public in general. And it's important to recognize that in the communications world. We also went on to see what, was the, what were the biggest factors, and I won't belabor this, but the, uh, we looked at their, you know, people's environmental values, their perceptions of risk, whether they agreed with timber harvesting, and what were the big drivers of their support for herbicide use. And it turned out trust was the lar had the largest influence. So trust is really important. Uh, if you're, in, if you're in, in any company, if you're in a, uh, a government agency, you really need to have trust, as I think we understand. And there's a fair bit of research about trust these days. Uh, we all, it's fragile, it's, uh, it's destroyed instantly. It's built very slowly over time. One negative event carries more weight. In fact, the ratio has been developed in the research. One negative event is equal to three or four positive events. Those of you that are married can understand this equation. Uh, but there's also a biological reason for why we view negative events uh, more than positive events. Uh, going back to being uh, us being preyed upon in our biological history, at least there's a cool hypothesis about that. So negative events obviously are more visible. Bad news is more credible than good news. Once you have distrust, it's self-perpetuating. And you re if you live in a participatory democracy, you need to have trust. If you live in a dictatorship, eh, trust isn't all important. The other uh, thing is understanding how we communicate risk. Uh, we've got uh, the way we, a lot of us in the scientific community view it is it's very scientific, probabilistic. We talk about acceptable risk. We talk about population averages. The public doesn't see it that way. These say, they're very intuitive. It's either safe or it's not safe. They worry about dis, uh, discrete events and personal consequences. And it does matter how we die. It's not a, it's not a, a, a population average. So this business of uh, risk communication is really important to bridging this gap of a fellow named uh, Vince Cavello, if any of you have seen his work, does a wonderful job providing some of the key elements of risk communication. The la uh, wrapping this up, there's a, uh, the other thing that's been going on, and I've seen it during my career, it's uh, really a lack of credibility on the part of uh, scientists and the scientific community and the research that we do. Tom Nichols in 2017 wrote a book about this, Death of Expertise, and talked about the the forces that are undermining the value of expertise and experts in the U.S. And he, and he blames several things. He blames uh, me. Uh, I'm a professor at a university and we're giving kids A's and they're mistakenly thinking that they're, when they get an A that they're getting, uh, uh, that they're experts. And so even the uh, college student views of expertise is being compromised because of what we're doing in higher education. 
And I couldn't agree with them more, and that's a long conversation. Uh, obviously, the information explosion in the, uh, on the internet, where, uh, where people that have probably little or no background have uh, seemingly expert opinions about things, and you hear these opinions over and over again, and then they become expertise, and that there's this echo chamber effect, obviously having an, uh, an influence. Uh, obviously, the growth of social media and the anti-authority uh, sentiment that's uh, uh, pervasive there, and and you know the anti-authority uh, issue goes hand in hand with expertise uh, and you know the intellectualism. So the so social media has turned against uh, expertise, and then in modern journalism, it's not what it was. They're everybody's a customer, and they're working with sound bites, and so the opportunity to be truly informed on, um, on issues and then calling it all fake news makes it, uh, you know, diminishes it. So I think he has a pretty good assessment of what, uh, why what we do at universities and research uh, institutions and government, uh, why we are, um, you know, have uh, credibility issues. There's also, and I don't need to tell any of you, we live in a highly polarized political environment. There's been some pretty good work on how politics affects people's view of science. So, uh, you know, if you're on the le liberal end of the political spectrum, you tend to reject science related to genetically modified organisms, pesticides, nuclear power. Interesting about vaccines before COVID. And this, I, I dropped in forestry because in all my years of working in several states and the Canadian province and uh, dealing with forest policy, they, uh, uh, the people on the left tend to not believe me more than the people on the right. So I don't know, they might be right. The, uh, but if you're on the conservative end of the political spectrum, you're not absolved of guilt, uh, rejection of climate change, science, evolution, pollution, renewable energy. And interestingly, after COVID, vaccines have shifted to the right side of the political uh, spectrum. As a general rule, liberals, though, however, tend to be have a higher trust of scientists and believe the, 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 the information that is provided. Conservatives tend to have a lower trust of science and see sort of a general on the street opinion as being equal to that of an expert. So if you go out and uh, ask people, do you, do you want public policy based on science and, and, ev uh, and evidence? And it's interesting. We, in fact, the survey I just showed you from a number of years ago, we found, you know, if you ask people that, 80 to 90 percent will tell you they want public policy based on science. And in fact, here's some work from the uh, American Academy of Arts and Sciences on a public perceptions of science, you know, and it shows the same thing. You know, public policies, 70 to 90 percent, yeah, they want uh, public policy to be based on, on science. However, and I know Pat Strzok will tell you this, that if you ever get involved in the policy environment, that everybody wants science-based or evidence-based policy, um, but there's a corollary, unless it conflicts with their politics, religion, superstitions, or personal financial gain. Then, eh, I'm not that interested in science-based policy. And uh, that is the frustration for those that are working in the policy environment, particularly those trying to have science applied to uh, uh, various public policy decisions. The last thing is this human nature conflict. And there's, gosh, this has been written about. It's in art, politics, and poetry and for many, many centuries. But you know, as a general rule, the public is in fear of the loss of nature. There's, uh, the loss in, of the forest environment was viewed as riskier than herbicides, dioxin, and nuclear power plants in the study that I showed you recently, uh, or just a, a few slides ago. And, um, Human values about forests are really deep-seated and, and emotional. Because uh, th those of us out there managing forest vegetation and whatnot, we end up with a very a view that boy, so nature's tough. It's really resilient. But if you're if you're a public, you see it as fragile, and easily easily damaged. And of course, any stigmatized technology like clear cutting and herbicides are viewed as a threat to nature. So the one thing to keep in mind is that when it comes to this nature-human idea, we accept that uh, nature has been sacrificed in urban and suburban areas. We're gonna live there, it's our habitat, but we're, we're gonna sacrifice nature. The other place we sacrifice it is on uh, landscapes that are agricultural or pasture based. So we understand eating and we're gonna have agriculture and we're gonna have grazing animals and we don't worry much about nature on these particular um, uh, landscapes. So where does that leave nature? 
So all nature and biodiversity ends up getting assigned to forests. And whether we like it or not, whether a government forester or an industry forester, you are viewed by the public as the default protectors of nature. And one of the reasons that we have uh, you know, this deeply emotional political conflict associated with forests around the world, actually, uh, you can go anywhere uh, and see the, uh, the same effects. We, uh, we need to recognize and adapt to that, this particular idea. And that means change the conversation. So the science of forest vegetation management, the actual science of it is not dead. Uh, but I can tell you, after many decades of doing this now, um, it's never been more walking dead in the public eye than it is today. And uh, which is a bit, for, for those of us doing research, is a bit of a tough pill to swallow. I don't expect that Rick and his well-armed heroes are going to be coming out of the woodwork anytime soon to uh, protect us on this particular issue. It's going to take, I don't know where it's going to go. Uh, this has been going on for a couple decades, and I, it's... It's headed, the, the, if you put an arrow on the credibility of science, it's a downward arrow right now. And uh, I think it affects everything we do in public policy, or certainly everything that you're all going to do uh, when it comes to science and uh, forest science and making public policy around that. Thank you very much.